Sama has been with us. Is it a double digit number of weeks yet? I was trying to think it might still be a single digit number. I think that we might be in week nine. So we're nine, the last single digit number of weeks um, already in these nine weeks. Such a joy um, to have Sama on board already. Uh, all of us, certainly myself, I am the better for it. I am so much calmer. Uh, with Sama on board. So, um, Sama, over to you. Thank you, Megan. Um, welcome back, folks. Um, it is my great pleasure to reintroduce and more fully introduce Tope Fullerin to you all. And if you were here yesterday with us, here's what you hopefully already know about Tope. He's based in Washington, D.C., and he serves as Vice President of Content and Storytelling at the Local Initiatives Support Corporation, and as uh, the chair of the board of trustees um, of the Institute for Policy Studies. You also likely know that he's uh, an, a Nigerian American writer who grew up with Achebe's writing in his home. I think yesterday he told us that Things Fall Apart was a, was a book that he started reading as, uh, at a young age, as did I, at a young age, because it was a book that his father kept in the house. Um, but here are some interesting and brilliant things that you may not know about him. Tope is a Morehouse man. And Tope, I don't even know if people say that anymore. I'm very much out of touch. But when I was growing up, it was like, oh, it's a Morehouse man. Um, uh, he completed his undergraduate degree at Morehouse and then went on to the University of Oxford where he earned two master's degrees uh, while being a Rhodes Scholar there. Another fact that you might not know is that in uh, 2013, he was awarded the Kane Prize uh, for African writing for his short story entitled Miracle, which is a story that's set in Texas um, with an evangelical Nigerian church at the center. Um, some more things about his writing, his debut novel, A Particular Kind of Black Man uh, was published in August, 2019. So just, uh, well, I always skip 2020 in my brain right now, but. I guess that's like two years ago at this point, almost. Um, and um, it's just been receiving all the praise. NPR named his novel one of the best books of 2019. The New York Times named um, Tope's book uh, one of their most anticipated titles of August 2019. And the book, uh, A Particular Kind of Black Man, is a sweeping and stirring and perspective shifting novel that centers on a Nigerian and Nigerian American family living in Utah and their process of assimilating to what US life is like in that landscape. And um, it is um, a Bildungsroman. So it follows this protagonist, his name, the protagonist's name, um, I hope I pronounced this correctly, is Tunde Akinola. Akinola and it follows him from through childhood and into adolescence and beyond. Um, so please check that book out, uh, A Particular Kind of Black Man. Um, and Tope's talk today will focus on the impact of Achebe and Things Fall Apart on African fiction from his viewpoint as an artist. Um, and he will also talk about the anxiety of influence. So please, Tope. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Oh, okay. <laughs> I almost forgot. Um, so um, Tope is going to be with us until, um, going to be speaking until uh, 7.15 at 7.10. I will spotlight my video. I will pop back up. This will just be, just so everyone knows, there's about five minutes left so that I don't have to do like an awkward thing where I'm like, <clears throat> you, know, <laughs> you can play right. me off like the Oscars, you know, just. <laughs> Get some strings going. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's such a pleasure to be speaking to uh, all of you under the auspices of the Maine Humanities Council. Uh, I spent some time in Maine in my, I think I'm still young, but I'll just use this phrase anyway, in my youth. Um, when I was 19, um, I was, as, as just mentioned, I spent my undergraduate years at Morehouse College. Uh, but spent a year at Bates College in Lewiston, Maine. And that for me was just an incredibly important moment in my life because um, I, it was an opportunity to kind of step away from everything that was going on. As all of you know, or at least those of you who are based in Maine know, Maine can get very, very cold. And so I was kind of forced to engage with myself in a way that I hadn't before. 
uh, and I met my partner there uh, as well. And now we have two kids. So it was a truly consequential period in my life. So uh, in many ways, this is kind of full circle moment for me. Uh, and it's, it's great to be here. Um, I guess my the, the topic of my talk has already been previewed. So allow me to share my screen so you can follow along as I offer the presentation. Let's see. So I'm gonna be talking about the legacy of Achebe. Um, and I think as you have probably gathered over the course of the past couple of days, uh, Achebe has a tremendous legacy on all of us, all of us who create art, I, I suppose in an African context and well beyond of course as well, people like me who were born and raised in the diaspora are deeply impacted by his work and writers from all uh, walks of life as well have commented on the impact of Achebe's work on their art and their sort of the way they perceive themselves as human beings. So uh, I, I won't speak at length about that, but obviously I will foreground for a moment the importance of things fall apart and Achebe in my own life as, a, as an artist. I'm gonna talk at the beginning about the impact of things fall apart. Again, you've probably heard a great deal about it already, but I'll offer my two cents on that. But I'm most interested in how the book has impacted African literature and successive generations of African writers and writers like me who emerged from the diaspora. Uh, again, I was born and raised in this country in the United States of America, but Achebe has had a profound and uh, compelling and enduring impact on my art. So I wanna talk a bit about that as well. Um, I'm also interested in the kind of tremendous cultural power that Achebe accrued uh, both because of the success of Things Fall Apart and also because of his tenure at, at, at the helm of the African Writer Series, which I'm sure you've already heard about before as well. But um, Achebe became a really kind of compelling and, and powerful figure because of these things. And so I want to touch on that a bit as well. First of all, I want to talk about the cultural moment in which Achebe was writing. So for the most part, Africa was seen as a kind of destination of literary texts from the West. I have a number of friends who grew up um, when Achebe published his, his first trilogy of novels and afterwards, and they all tell me that there weren't many uh, books by African writers they could access, that for the most part, they were reading books uh, from Europe and America. And so many folks who grew up in those countries, and even people like me who grew up abroad, um, we rarely saw ourselves reflected in fiction. Our sense was that if we were reading a book, we would likely encounter a protagonist who had fair skin and, and fair hair, um, and that because of the power of literature, we saw ourselves in these characters, but that these characters didn't really reflect our life experiences. There are two notable exceptions, two novels that were published before Achebe's Thing Fell Apart uh, was released in 1958. The most notable of those are um, Amos Tutola's Palm White Drinker, which was released in 1952, and Cyprian Equensi's People of the City, which was released, uh, published, I should say, in 1954. But by the time that Things Fall Apart came out, the African novel was still very much in its infancy. I don't think there was a solid sense of what African fiction was, certainly what the African novel was and could be. Um, and there were very few that believed that a work that was penned, if you will, by an African writer would have anything important to say to the rest of the world. Uh, so, as I mentioned, Things Fell Apart published in 1958 after an initial run of 2,000 copies. It began to sell at a rapid clip, um, and it sold a bunch of copies after it became mandatory reading for the Cambridge School Certificate Examinations for overseas students in the United Kingdom. So here we begin to see that Things Fell Apart uh, is kind of becoming a part of what could be called or described as a kind of African canon. It's probably the first entry. There's an argument that it remains the only entry, but this is when that process begins. And certainly the old, sort of the early 60s when um, folks around the world start to say, this is a book that you have to read if you wanna understand what's going on in Africa. It's also well that it convinced publishers at Hyman, uh, which was uh, Achebe's publisher, that there was a market for African fiction. Uh, uh, I'm sure you've heard the story about how this book came to press in the first place. Achebe was working um, as, as a story I told in brief last night. He was working uh, at a, a, for a very prominent radio station in, in Nigeria and wrote this novel in his 20s, sent it off to London, um, uh, didn't hear anything about it for a year. He asked a colleague of his who was going to London on, on her vacation to check on the status of the book. She went to the publishing house. Uh, they claimed they didn't have the book. They searched their stacks, they found the book, um, and they subsequently decided to publish it. So a very meandering path to, uh, to getting published. Uh, 
Uh, but once it was out in the world, people began to recognize it. it was a really important work and began to engage with it in a really robust way. Achebe, after, soon after the publication of this book, became the series editor for the African Writer Series, which is an incredibly influential uh, series that spotlighted the work of any number of African writers. And I'll talk a bit more about that a bit later in my presentation. So the great thing about Achebe is that he achieved something that no African had before. Um, uh, and the two novels I mentioned before are really impactful and important novels. I encourage all of you, I think they're, they're both still impressed to go out there and read them and, and take away your own kind of, uh, your, engage with them on your own level and, and take away um, your own sense of what those novels might mean in the world from, from your reading, uh, from engaging with them. But he achieved something that no writer had achieved before because he merged storytelling traditions of the West um, with his own kind of Igbo traditions that he had grown up with. Um, and the, the most interesting thing about this book was that it was also palatable to the West as well. And that's part of the reason that was, is that uh, Achebe was working in a Western tradition in a way, like the novel is structured in the way that many novels that were released at the time were structured. And so he had a deep understanding of the way that writers in the West were writing novels. And he, in his own way, kind of adopted that um, and adapted that structure to his own purposes when he released Things Fall Apart. Uh, in so doing this, he, tried to, he tr created a, a template for African fiction, and perhaps more important than that, for the kind of fiction, the kind of African fiction that could sell in the West. Um, and so I think we're beginning to talk here about the, the anxiety of influence that any number of writers who have written after Achebe kind of feel because of the profound example of, of, of his influence. Um, he offered a compelling narrative that showed how the Igbo lived before the British arrived and how the Igbo were, were, were changed forever by that encounter. I first read Things Fall Apart, for real, for real, I suppose you could say, when I was in high school, uh, like many others, I'm sure. Um, the context was different for me because Achebe was a hero in my house for as long as I could remember. Uh, my dad had a very, my dad wasn't somebody who read much literary fiction, but uh, we had a couple books in our house and Things Fall Apart was one of those books. Um, we also had a couple of plays by Shoinka that were hanging around. And my father, uh, I was born and raised in Utah in the Western United States. Um, I integrated my elementary school when I was quite young. So there just weren't many examples, first of all, of black cultural success and certainly of Nigerian cultural success. So my dad did his best to kind of create an atmosphere where I and my siblings could believe that we could create something impactful and contribute something important to the world as well. Um, I didn't know what the story was about when, because it was, you know, it had pride of place in my house. I didn't know what it was, what it was about, but I knew that its very existence kind of disproved everything I was hearing on the playground, for example, from my friends about Africa. You know, uh, like many sons and daughters of African immigrants, I was called all kinds of horrible names on the playground, like African booty scratcher. I was told any number of times that my, my family had emerged from the trees, we had tails, all kinds of horrible things. And so this is what I heard in school. And whenever I went home, I was offered a different example of black greatness and black genius and black artistic merit. My dad would consistently play music from Nigeria, like Sonny Ade, Ebenezer Obe, all kinds of folks. My dad played a lot of Sade when I was growing up because his point was here was a musician who was doing well, uh, both in the UK and the United States, was loved by many people. Um, and then later on, Seal, when he rose to prominence in the early 90s, he was another person who uh, my dad was very fond of. There were people like Akim Olajuwon who played basketball. So my dad did his, his part to kind of build this kind of, uh, I suppose, uh, Mount Olympus of Nigerian heroes that my siblings and I could relate to when we were young. I hope you allow me a point of personal privilege to include a picture of me as a young child. That's me, I believe, at four or five. Um, that's my brother behind me. And, um, and this is the person I was when my dad was doing his very best to ensure that my brothers and me had a sense of importance and belonging, despite the fact that we were literally growing up out of context. We were growing up in a place that didn't have this idea of what blackness meant, its importance. And my dad was, um, he worked really hard to ensure that we had a deep understanding of our culture and a love of that culture as well. Another picture of me as a youth. Uh, me and my brother in Ogden, Utah in the mid 80s. Um, 
So I read the book uh, in high school and it had a tremendous impact on me. I remember reading the book and for the first time, it's an encounter that I've thought about a number of times since then, why it was so impactful. I think it was so impactful because it was the first time that I saw someone resembling my father, I, I guess I should say, in the text. My father, I don't want to say he's like a conquo, um, but in certain ways he is. He's a very masculine, proud man. Um, he's very kind of self-assured and confident. Uh, and, and he also um, is deeply ambitious as well. And so as I was reading the book, I thought I, I, I was somebody who grew up reading a lot of books. I read a lot of fantasy and science fiction. I loved Star Trek, for example. I was a sci-fi geek growing up. Um, but I was accustomed to seeing different faces and different perspectives reflected in the work that I was engaging with. And it was just incredible to see, uh, to read a book, I should say, in which someone who looked, who at least the way I envisioned it, kind of looked like my father, um, comported himself like my father, and in which the food that I'd grown up eating was featured prominently. These were all incredibly important things to me uh, when I read the book for the first time. Uh, and so the, for the first time, I also, I felt this intimate connection to this country that I had only visited once. I'd only been to Nigeria when I was about, I think, just one. Um, and so I didn't really have a sense of what Nigeria meant. I had no memories of my time there. Um, and it was the first time I felt this connection to Nigeria, um, a country that was discussed all the time when I was growing up. And as I mentioned before, a country, I, I was familiar with the, the culture of the country, even if I didn't have a sense of um, what it meant to live there. By reading this book, I felt for the first time that, oh, I, I have this connection to Nigeria. I think I began to understand too, after I read this book, um, what Nigeria had lost as a result of its engagement with Europe, that initial engagement. Um, one long running conversation that my father and I had when I was growing up uh, was around religion, for example. My father is an ardent Christian. He's a Pentecostal Christian. It's something that's deeply important to him. And as I kind of began to grow up and question the world as all teenagers do, I asked him why he was a Christian when the story he had often told me was that my family became, had been a prominent family in Nigeria for some time, but became even more prominent after the British arrived because my grandfather performed really well in colonial schools. And they kind of, uh, they, they, they believed that he was somebody who would contribute to the new Nigeria that was emerging as the British were leaving. And so my grandfather had a successive of important roles in that society. And this was a story that my dad told with a lot of pride when I was growing up. But as I grew older, I thought, um, was that a kind of capitulation on the part of my grandfather? Again, this is an adolescent thought. And, and, and in addition to that, I questioned the fact that my grandfather was among the first in his school to convert to Christianity. Um, and I wondered what the, why he jettisoned the beliefs he had grown up with in order to do that. And so my dad and I would have these long back and forths about um, religion and its place in Nigeria and Christianity and whether it was legitimate for a Nigerian to be a Christian, especially considering the way that Christianity came to Nigeria. After reading this book, I placed a lot of those arguments that I had been having with myself and my father in context, and I began to understand more deeply uh, how it was and why certain people in Nigeria made the decision to convert to Christianity. Um, the book also, I think in really important ways, kind of contextualized a sense of loss that I had that didn't have, I couldn't identify it really, um, I'm applying language to it now, but when I was growing up, I had this deep emptiness within me that I can never really get my arms around. And I'm reading the book, uh, after reading the book, I should say, I began to understand in a really deep way some of the conversations that my parents had around the dinner table about the way they miss Nigeria, uh, the conversations that they'd have on the rare occasion when somebody from Nigeria visited our home in Utah. Uh, I, and the sense of loss that suffused even the deep laughter that they would um, that they that they would laugh whenever you know somebody raised a joke or or reference a memory from Nigeria back in the day. Uh, that sense of loss was palpable. It was always there. And after reading the book, I began to understand why that sense of loss was present. After reading the book, I craved more stories about Africa, about Nigeria, and I went to my librarian because, again, we had read this in high school and asked her if she had any other African novels I could read, and she told me that this was the only African novel there was. Um, and that's what I believed for a while. And so I was sad about it. And I wondered, how can this be? And 
um, because I emerged from a, con uh, a family where there are a number of intelligent people who are doing all kinds of things. I didn't believe for a moment that there was only one person who could write a novel that reached out to the world, but that's what I was told and that's what I believed for a time. So for many years in the United States and the rest of the West, Chinua Achebe was the African writer after uh, he published Things Fall Apart. Um, so his status as an artist shifted radically after Things Fall Apart became successful, uh, though he struggled, as I mentioned before, to get the book published initially. After the book was published, it, it, it achieved this incredible success. I think it was more successful than even he could have imagined. Uh, and for many years, it became the kind of template for what the African novel could and should be. And there's a normative sort of uh, argument here as well, this idea that if you write African fiction, it has to conform to the standard that has been set by the grand king of African literature, Chinua Achebe. Uh, Things Fall Apart was required reading uh, in countless high schools around the country, in the United States, across Europe and universities as well. And for many people, uh, Things Fall Apart was their only way that they really uh, kind of engaged in a deep way with African culture. So many of the images that we get around Africa are, you know, sort of starving children in various parts of Africa or born in torn parts of Africa. Um, for many years, there wasn't the kind of uh, understanding of the humanity of the people who live there and the kinds of things they, they experience, the idea that people who live across the continent uh, love deeply, they're, uh, you know, they, they, they gossip all the time. They're human beings in the same way that we are. Uh, we didn't really get that full depiction of humanity. So Things Fall Apart was the one example in many contexts where people were, were able to kind of contemplate the humanity of Africans. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about why this was the case. Why was Achebe's novel the only novel of his generation to really punch through, to break through, um, and to have this international outsized impact on the world? I think one reason is, and this is a, a theory that many others have as well, is that it spoke directly to this kind of dawning post-colonial moment. Um, as many Africans were about to declare independence, there was a wave of independence movements across um, Africa that started in the mid 50s with Ghana extended all the way, I guess, to the early 80s with Zimbabwe. And this text provided a way for people in Nigeria, people across Africa and around the world to understand what preceded the colonial moment and what the post colonial moment can mean as well. Um, and it also, I think, uh, there was a kind of nostalgia that still is present and evident, and I think is really it's even more profound in my generation of what existed before, you know, this kind of, again, sense of loss about what existed before. What did Africa and Nigeria and all kinds of folks lose as a result of this, um, this, this encounter with the Europeans? Uh, this book speaks directly to that in a way. Um, and it speaks, as for, so for the Westerner, this book also features Western characters, which seems to be a kind of requirement for a lot of fiction that engages with the West. Uh, and so for the reader in the United Kingdom or the reader in the, in the United States who uh, has to see themselves in a book in order for them to comprehend the book, this book contained that element as well. I think as I th think about African history and African literary history in particular, the success of Things Fall Apart also demonstrated how precarious the enterprise of African fiction really was, and especially African novels. Um, the success of a particular novel has less to do with how it conveys the stories of the people that it conveys, um, and more with how the West perceives that book, right, and how that book is valued in the West. And that places African writing, um, I guess, in a similar plane as perhaps South American writing and Indian writing, which is to say that a lot of what happens around the production of these works and the dissemination of these works uh, happens abroad, it happens externally. Um, and so as a writer of fiction, you're constantly thinking about how it might be perceived in some foreign capital. This is a burden that writers, for example, who work in the United States or the United Kingdom, just as two examples, or Germany or across Europe don't have to contend with. They, you know, they have their own set of concerns that all writers have. Like, will somebody like this work? Does it, is it publishable? Um, is it marketable? Uh, will anyone read it? You know, these are concerns that all writers have. But uh, for writers who are writing outside the West, there's an additional layer of concern about if your work will kind of um, conform to the idea of Africa or South America or India that the editor 
a, a white editor in a publishing house in London or UK, in London, I should say, or New York has about these places. Um, and I think in addition that Western tastemakers and kingmakers have consistently demonstrated that there isn't much space in the West for non-Western stories and art. So the funny thing about this is that I'm sure if I pulled some folks on the call and, and, and asked them to name like five uh, post-war American novelists, we can name them instantly. Um, if I ask you to name um, sort of five novelists from say Haiti, I'm sure the one name that probably comes up was Edgefield Zanticat. And this, um, I wrote an essay about this actually a couple of years ago, this idea that, um, that for many Westerners, they have it seems that they have space in their minds and their bookshelves for one representative from you know some other cultural context, right? So if we're talking about Haiti, you know, Danticat, if we're talking about the, Minic the Dominican Republic, Juno Diaz, and the list goes on, right? Um, and so for many, many years, Chinua Achebe filled that role not only for Nigeria, but for Africa at large. And there are other novelists who are working and doing incredible work in Africa. Um, and Gugi Wathiongo is one prominent example who rises to mind, but he wasn't being read. Uh, across sort of uh, both continents. I'm speaking of Europe and America the way that Chinu Achebe was. So Achebe's success not only determined the rules uh, for success for any you know, future would-be African novelist, it also kind of foreclosed the possibility, not only that any other novelist could achieve the same success because these novelists weren't Achebe, but it also kind of foreclosed creative possibilities as well. Um, one thing I'm really obsessed with, for example, is visual art. I spent a lot of time, one of the hardest parts of this pandemic is the fact that I haven't been able to go to museums as often as I did before. And if you go to any sort of prominent museum in the West, you're, uh, this, the, the kind of major museums, I'm thinking like the Met uh, in New York, or let's say um, the, National, uh, the, the National Gallery of Art here in Washington, DC, uh, you're encountering a kind of timeline of art, right? And you're always confronted with, you know, here is an idea that a certain uh, artist had about the way to depict uh, some aspect of the reality. Here's how other artists responded to that. And this really interesting uh, back and forth between artists across geography and across time about how to render the world that we all inhabit. Um, this doesn't happen for uh, African novelists. What happens is that every publisher and editor and critic has in mind what an African novel is meant to be. And that's represented by Things Fall Apart. And so if you want to speak, or I should say, write beyond the boundaries that have been established by Things Fall Apart, uh, you're faced with an especially precarious situation because you're, again, engaging with a host of tastemakers who don't have a deep understanding of what's happening on the continent of Africa or even in the diaspora. And so their only sense of what's going on is this book that was published in 1958 by this fantastically gifted writer. Um, but there isn't a sense of what kind of response there might be to that or, what, or, or who uh, is in a position to offer a, a wonderful creative response to that work. So in other words, Achebe became the one who uh, kind of presided over African fiction and presides over all of us who, in a way, uh, seek to respond to the work that he did and extend uh, the work that he, he did as well. Achebe's status, it mirrors the fates of other artists who are working in the same time and afterward. Um, and I, and, um, and I think the, the main thing to, to remember here is that it's because uh, because this is happening externally, because the folks who are determining what African fiction is aren't working in Africa. And so that becomes um, a barrier for any number of people who wanna contribute to this conversation about African art. So Achebe, as I've said, became kind of the sh shorthand for African fiction. And this was despite his efforts. You know, as I mentioned, he edited the African Writers Series. Uh, the AWS was responsible for int introducing uh, a wonderful set of writers to the world, including Ngugi Wathiongo, Bessie Head, who's somebody I love and read obsessively in grad school, Doris Lessing, all kinds of wonderful writers either published their first work or some of their most prominent work with the African Writers Series. Um, and so when I got to Oxford, I, one of my masters was in African studies and I knew about the African Writers Series when I arrived at Oxford, but I hadn't really read much um, of the series. And I set for myself the tax when I got to Oxford of reading every book that I could in the series. One of the great things about Oxford is you can find virtually any book you want there, either at the Bodleian or, you know, on the street, walking down the street, somebody's always selling used books. And so I 
kind of began to curate my own personal collection of African writer series books. Many of them are right behind me, actually. And I started to read them one by one by one. And the thing that I found that was incredible about this, uh, this series was that uh, the series, the writers in the series discussed all kinds of African lives and all kinds of African scenarios, right? Not just about Africa's engagement with the West, but what's happening in this particular province uh, of this country or what's even happening in a household or what's happening between two people who are falling in love. Um, the folks who edited the African writer series, including of course, Chinua Achebe, uh, kind of swept up the entirety or at least a great part of African life and rendered it in the pages of these books. And here are some of the, the writers, some of whom you might recognize and others perhaps you may not, but these are the writers who were working in the African writer series and producing such compelling art, uh, not only for Africa, but of course, for the rest of the world. Yet most of these writers with a few notable exceptions, Nadine Gordimer and Doris Lessing both published in their African writer series weren't as well known as Achebe. And it should be noted too that Nadine Gordimer and Doris Lessing also went on to win Nobel prizes, a prize that eluded Chino Achebe. Um, over the course of his life. By focusing so vigilantly on one writer, uh, critics and readers in the West didn't engage with the full uh, humanity that I just discussed with respect to the African writer series. They were engaging with this one emissary from Nigeria who, for, at least it seems from their perspective, contained all the knowledge that one needed to know about what was going on in Africa. Uh, so as I read the African writer series uh, at Oxford, um, and I read, again, Bessie Head and a writer named Alex Laguma really had a profound impact on me as I began to kind of get it in my mind that perhaps I was going to throw my hat in the ring of this literary thing and try my hand at writing a novel. It was something I had to convince myself of, I should say, because even despite the fact that my dad was very good about creating this cultural context where my siblings and I um, could believe in this notion that Africans could create compelling art, my dad was like many immigrant parents in that he uh, wanted me to be a doctor. And if I failed as a doctor, then I could become a lawyer. And so I had in my mind this idea when I went to Oxford um, on a Rhodes scholarship, my dad had been disappointed with me in, in, in many ways until I won the Rhodes. And so when I won the Rhodes as a senior at Morehouse College, as a Morehouse man, that is still an appropriate term. <laughs> um, uh, I, the first feeling I had was one of deep relief because I envisioned in my mind, I was in a room uh, so, it's, it's Rhodes Scholarship is a very intense interview process, and what happens at the end of the process is um, they will line all the candidates up, and somebody, the judges, will come out and say, "Okay, here are the folks who run Rhodes Scholarships." And I was the one black person in uh, that room, and I was the one person from a black school as well. Everyone else was from Ivy League schools or uh, certain small Ivies as well. And here I am from Morehouse College. And so they announced the names. I was one of the names. My life kind of fell away for half a second. I didn't know what was happening. And then when I gained my senses, I thought, well, this is something I can give to my dad. Um, because uh, every immigrant parent lives for the moment when they're having dinner with another immigrant parent and they can brag about what their kids are doing. Um, and so my dad had more ammunition he could offer you know, when he was having a conversation with his fellow immigrant parents. And I didn't have to kind of live up to that anymore. So I really saw Oxford as an opportunity to kind of figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And as I began to read the African Writers series, I began to have the sense that maybe I can contribute to this literary conversation um, that I saw sort of playing out before me as I read these books. Um, so I, as I read these books, I also began to kind of understand how impoverished the general perception of African fiction was because my own sense of African fiction had been really impoverished at that point. Um, all these wonderful books, all these wonderful narratives, beautifully rendered, beautifully edited, um, and yet the idea, the general sense of what African fiction meant was still things fall apart. And for me, that was maddening because I wanted to write my own book that would obviously be influenced in certain important ways by the example of Achebe, but also would respond to and again, reach beyond what he was reading about, he was writing about. Um, and so I began to read a, across a lot of traditions when I was at Oxford as well. I read Indian novels and various uh, novels from various countries in South America. And I began to think about literary canons, you know, the kind of idea of creating a canon of work. Um, generally, generally, as we, I think we all know, a canon is formed over time, right? Uh, when a book is released, a hoax of critics might deba debate how artful the book is, whether it addresses larger concerns in a particular society, and whether this is, you know, sort of the best, as it were, like whether you have critics in their own time who were saying, you know, this is a book that will stand the test of time. This is the book that 
people 50 to 100 years from now will be reading when they want to get a sense of how we live during this time. And then, of course, in subsequent generations, critics and academics will debate whether those books merit the attention that uh, critics, that contemporaneous critics offered that work, um, that whether the ideas that are rendered in, the, in that book hold up, and all kinds of other considerations. So there's this kind of longitudinal aspect to creating a canon over time, right? Like it's, it's something that takes place over generations as critics are engaging with each other, as writers, too, are participating in that process and talking about how they've been influenced by certain work. Uh, the one work of literary art from Africa that's really received that kind of sustained attention over the years is Things Fall Apart. And the African Writers Series, as wonderful as it was, as influential as it was to writers like me and other writers as well and academics across the world, um, it also reveals the problem of trying to invent a literary tradition from abroad. Um, there were other publishing houses that were publishing African fiction at the time, but the African Writers Series was the most prominent and it reflected the biases of a small kind of brain trust of gatekeepers who were in London or had connections to London, right? And so this small collection of people was deciding the African fiction that everybody would get to engage with. And um, I don't think this is how you build a literary canon, unfortunately, because there's not that kind of really intense engagement and literary fallouts and everything that should happen in a, in a wonderfully um, sort of robust literary culture. So over time, the African Writers Series, it, the influence of it began to wane and publishing houses across the world began to lose interest in African fiction. There is this really unfortunate period of time that extends uh, in my reckoning from probably the late 80s until the 2000s when you just didn't see much African fiction at all that was being published. And the thing that's really tragic about this is that you had a number of talented writers of that generation um, who simply didn't have a, a chance to get their work published uh, in the way that even folks in the African Writer Series saw their work published. They were writing and publishing houses weren't interested. They were all saying that nobody's interested in this work. Uh, we can't sell this work. And I have personally um, uh, corresponded with and even met a number of older African writers from across the continent who lament the fact that there wasn't a kind of environment for them to produce this work, especially painful for them because they were writing under the influence of the African Writer Series, Anna Chebe, and they felt stymied in their ability to kind of contribute to the conversation that was happening. And they felt especially mad about the fact that conversations about African literature were still confined to what was happening in the 50s and 60s. There were some novels that managed to break through like Nervous Conditions, which was released in 1988. It's a book that I read for the first time at Bates College actually. Uh, my junior year. So it was a really important book for me. I didn't know the book existed before my professor, Professor Leslie Hill at uh, Bates assigned the text. And I read the book and I thought, wow, like again, once again, I was confronted with somebody who seemed like me that the protagonist of that book is also kind of poised on the precipice between Africa and the West and is trying to kind of form an identity um, that kind of includes aspects of both. And it's a really difficult thing. I could relate to that personally in a very deep way because I was also engaged at that time in the process of constructing identity and I had no I had no idea about how to go about doing that because my parents had handed me this identity card that said I was a Nigerian specifically a Yoruba uh, Nigerian and the largest society had said you know typically you're black so you're an African American of course I was an American as well having been born and raised in this country and I had no idea how to merge these traditions within myself and Nervous Conditions offered a template of the kind of work I would have to do to get to a unified sense of self. So obviously it's a really important book, but again, it was one of the very few books that was released by an African writer during this extended drought period from the late 80s to the early 2000s. Every time I see that cover, it's deeply evocative for me because that's the cover that I saw. And it was just really powerful to kind of hold a text by an African writer that I felt spoke to me. And that's what all writer, readers want in a way, right? Like at least maybe I'm, maybe, maybe not all readers, but when I read a book, uh, I want to feel as if the book is speaking to me. And I had always thought that in the various books that I'd read over the course of my life, but this book really grabbed me by the neck and pulled me in um, in a really powerful way. So things began to change in the early 2000s around uh, African fiction. One of the things that changed is the emergence, uh, the establishment of the Kane Prize for African Writing in 2000. This was partly in response to the fact that a number of literary superstars, among them Achebe, um, but also Nadine Gordimer, uh, Jam Kotze, other folks said, you know, what's going on with African fiction? Why isn't this being published? And so 
again, a brain trust of folks who are largely, um, many of them anyway, uh, outside of Africa said, we have to do something about this. Let's establish this prize. Um, it's, it's, so the prize annually issues, issues a call to writers in Africa and the diaspora. I uh, qualified under that second clause uh, to submit short stories uh, for this 10,000 uh, pound prize. Um, and so a lot of things began to change after the prize, partly because the prize was established and all of a sudden you have um, literary critics and agents who are interested in the work that's emerging from the continent. And partly too, because, um, you know, books, immigrant books are beginning to kind of, and books that are based in other countries are beginning to win prizes and gain acclaim as well. This prize was still imperfect in certain ways. It's based in London. External gatekeepers are still deciding and determining um, what you know, whether a, a piece of fiction uh, it qualifies as a good piece of fiction or not, um, it's not happening within the continent. And I, again, I would offer the argument that if you want a really interesting and important uh, canon that actually speaks to what's going on in a particular context, those arguments have to happen within that context. With the Kane Prize, you have another example of people who are outside that context determining what qualifies as quote unquote African fiction. But that said, um, it still played this incredibly important role in sort of saying to the world, hey, there are a number of African writers who are producing important work, please engage with their stories. So a few short years after the prize was established, you kind of see a bumper crop of debut novels by African novel, African writers that are debuting to much fanfare of, all around the world, including Purple Hibiscus by Chimamanda Adichie, which was released in 2003, Beasts of No Nation, uh, 2005, The Beautiful Things That Heaven Bears by Dina Mangesu that was released in 2007. That's my, I, this was the first copy of Purple Hibiscus that I had. Uh, I, I read it for the first time as a junior at Morehouse. Uh, and this book kind of blew the top of my head off because of its kind of really trenchant observations about how religion impacts um, people who live in Nigeria. This was a topic that I was personally obsessed with and a topic that I would later write about in the first story I ever wrote called Miracle um, that was published by a journal at Harvard called Transition Magazine. So reading this book convinced me that maybe there was a place for the stories that I wanted to tell because Adichie was writing about a family that in so many ways resembled my own family. So I read Purple Hibiscus, I was super excited about it. I read Beasts of No Nation in graduate school when I was at Oxford, and then The Beautiful Things That Heaven, Heaven Bears when also when I started working. I, I worked uh, for two years in London after I left graduate school. I worked at Google in London. And so uh, actually one of the things I did when I worked at Google, Google getting into Google then was very difficult. I'm not sure what the case is now, but I had seven interviews on two continents, uh, very intense interviews uh, and and, you know, kind of, trying to convince them that I deserved a place at this company. The last interview, uh, there were like about five finalists and they asked us, they turned around and said, okay, what do you need from us if you were to get uh, hired at Google? And I said that I wanted to be a writer and I wanted to build up a collection of books that would enable me to kind of learn the craft and begin writing fiction. I guess they would like that answer because I was hired and they offered me 300 pounds a month to build my own personal library. And they also offered me uh, sometime over the course of a week, I could sort of uh, book a conference room and go in there and write my fiction. So I thought this was the perfect job. Like, wow, they are supporting me as a fiction writer. And I actually said too that I wanted to, I was really besotted with Russian literature at that point in my life. So I wanted to learn Russian so I could read the Russians in their original language. This was a foolhardy <laughs> quest of mine because uh, I just, I wasn't picking that up. You know, I tried for two months to learn Russian and I decided, well, there are some wonderful English translations. So I'll, I'll stick to that. Um, but so I'm, you know, kind of reading a bunch of books and um, I'm learning a great deal about the kind of writer I want to be. but. Also, it was super difficult because I was working like 70 hours a week. I spent a lot of my time, uh, I, I run, I was responsible for a sort of public policy uh, in a number of countries in the Middle East and Eastern Europe. I spent the bulk of my time in Turkey, specifically Ankara and Istanbul and Israel, Tel Aviv, Haifa and Jerusalem. And so I was on the road a lot. Um, I spent more time, let's say in Istanbul and Tel Aviv than I spent in London. So I just wasn't able to kind of spend time reading the, the way that I had imagined. And it was a really intense job. Um, but I was still kind of cognizant of what was happening and the fact that I was living in this moment when a bunch of African writers were beginning to publish work. And I wondered if and how I'd be able to join that, especially since I'm not, you know, like I wasn't born in Africa, but I, my work has certain concerns about the continent. I wondered 
if and how I'd be able to contribute to that conversation. So I was super excited. I remember vividly during this moment on the times when I was in London, going to various bookstores in London um, and just walking around and seeing books by African writers displayed prominently on the shelves and just kind of just being so excited that I was living in a moment where this was possible, where there were editors across the world who were looking at African fiction and, and publishing this fiction as well. Um, and it gave me hope that maybe I would be able to kind of contribute and, and, and write my own work. Um, so just to back up just a little bit, when I was at Oxford, I was part of this small community of Black students from across the world. Uh, Oxford is a very cosmopolitan place who were all kind of intent, we were all intensely interested in the arts. And so when I got to Oxford, I mentioned before this idea that I felt free. One of the first thing I did when I got to Oxford was I, I acted in a play. I hadn't acted since, you know, um, since I guess middle school. And I was aware of the fact that Shoinka had been an actor as well and had obviously published a number of plays. And I deeply admire Boy Shoinka. And so when I saw an opportunity, they, they were, a, a friend of mine was staging a production of Six Degrees of Separation, the great play by John Guare, which I had read actually at Bates College, I should mention. Um, I had a wonderful teacher at Bates, a professor at Bates. Um, who I, I was in one of her English classes and she pulled me aside after class one day and said, um, I want you, I want you to read, uh, I want you to watch a movie. And so she made me go to the library and watch Six Degrees of Separation. And the moment I watched it, I knew why she had assigned it because I, I related completely to the protagonist of that movie and play, uh, Paul Poitier, who's this um, really kind of debonair, well-spoken black guy who uh, manages to infiltrate white society um, and they kind of, they are obsessed with him because they think he's the son of, of Sidney Poitier. Um, and they um, are, you know, they're the kind of liberals who claim they're comfortable around black people, but really aren't. But he is welcome in their circles because he's the kind of black person they can be welcome. They, they feel they can relate to in a way. And I wondered about the extent to which I had fashioned a personality where I would be that kind of black person who made white people comfortable. And um, it was really important for me that a white professor um, was the one who kind of pointed this out to me that I was kind of doing that in a subconscious way, um, but that I was fashioning this personality and this way of being in the world that wasn't about expressing myself fully, but that was about ensuring that other people felt comfortable in my presence. Um, and so she subsequently assigned all kinds of like, in addition to the work that I was reading in class, she kind of created a personal syllabus for me. So I read um, uh, James Baldwin for the first time in that class. Um, I read um, many African writers for the first time in that class. I read many white writers, working class writers I never read before. Um, and so um, her name was Professor Carol Ann Taylor. She passed away a few years ago, unfortunately, but she was one of the major influences in my life, both from an academic and even kind of personal perspective. And the fact that she went out of her way to, um, you know, sort of pay special attention to me was something that was deeply meaningful. Um, so by the time I arrived at Oxford, I kind of knew about Six Degrees of Separation, and I saw that they were staging a play, and I thought, okay, this, the universe is speaking to me. I have to be this, this, I have to play, I have to, you know, sort of audition for this role, and I did, and I felt really proud of it. It only occurred to me later on that, you know, the, the star of this play is, uh, you know, sort of tall black man, and I was like one of maybe two tall black people at Oxford. So I, I'm not sure if I got the role because I was an outstanding thespian, but whatever the case may be. Um, you know, I, I, I auditioned for the role, I got it. I spent, you know, weeks of my life, sort of, I abandoned my studies, I should say, much to my father's chagrin. Uh, and I just kind of threw myself in the role, especially since I knew a number of my friends would be coming out to see the play. And we heard, as we were rehearsing, that the BBC was gonna come out and review the play. And so um, I just was very keen to not follow my face and embarrass myself. And so I did the play, things worked out. And after the play, a couple of people came up to me one from Ghana and another person from Jamaica. And they said, hey, we saw the play and we'd like to invite you to our group of, you know, sort of burgeoning artists. And we're, we're writing art, we're writing plays, we're writing short stories, we're writing novels, and we're trying to, try to create space for ourselves in this world. And I said, of course, I'd love to join. Um, and so I joined the group and we wrote, as some of them wrote plays that we acted in. We wrote stories that we would uh, pass along to each other and critique in a really wonderful way. Uh, we read every kind of literature we could find. It just so happened that one member of our group um, had an aunt who was, one member of our group was, um, her, her, her godmother was Toni Morrison. And so we were able to kind of, you know, sort of see certain texts before they were made public. Another person in the group, 
had, um, I guess, uh, some relative who worked as an editor at a publishing house. And so we also saw some of the African manuscripts that were being circulated before they were published. One manuscript we saw was a book by Chimamanda's second book um, uh, that, you know, sort of uh, that had this profound impact across the world and did all kinds of wonderful things. And so we read her book and we kind of had this sense that she was going to sort of break out in a way that she, that she hadn't before. And so it was it was wonderful to kind of be part of this group, to have conversations about art, to talk about, you know, our ambitions for art. And I have to say that some of us did manage to go on and make careers for ourselves. Uh, one member of the group was a woman named Taya Selassie, who published a book a few years ago that did pretty well. And um, others have become poets. And so we are still engaged in this conversation about like African art and the kinds of things that we want to do. Um, so we were, you know, some of us had direct connections to Africa. Others of us like me didn't have, you know, I have a direct connection in that my parents were born there, but I hadn't really been there before. And so this kind of idea about what it meant to be a member of the diaspora was also really important to us as we talked about art. Um, and so we also noticed certain trends as we discussed why these books had been successful. So for example, uh, Purple Hibiscus owes an obvious debt to Achebe's work. Uh, the book actually begins, things began to fall apart when, so she's kind of referencing directly her connection to Chino Achebe. Uh, and if you kind of go back and read some of the press material around Purple Hibiscus when it was released, you can see the kind of anxiety that publishers had about sort of trying to convince people in the West to read the book. Um, Chimamanda goes, she she writes at length and she speaks at length about her connections to Chino Achebe. You know, she's also Igbo like he was. She um, grew up in the house that he lived in um, for a time when he lived in Nigeria. So the, the, the point that you got from a lot of the messaging around the book was, you know, here is the next African writer. Here is the person who will replace Achebe after, you know, like almost 50 years. Um, and so we were aware of the idea that, you know, like it was like, first of all, Chimamanda owed obvious sort of art an obvious artistic debt to Chinua Achebe and that her work kind of reflected some of the themes that he discussed in his book, Beasts of No Nation, which is a book about child soldiers, obviously resonated because there was a lot of discussion in the press at that time about child soldiers and about the tragedy of child soldiers. So here was a fictionalized account of what they were experiencing that people could sort of read and engage with. And then the beautiful things that heaven bears was in so many ways a kind of classic immigrant novel. Um, and folks like Chumpa Lahiri and Amy Tan had already published uh, immigrant novels to wide acclaim both in the United States and across the world as well. And so it was obvious that some publish publishers were saying, okay, well, here's an African example of these kinds of books that have done well in the market. So we were aware that there were also kind of constraints in a way on the kind of work that we wanted to do, that if you want to be successful as an African writer, you might have to write directly to the headlines, you know, whatever, you know, sort of negative thing about Africa might is being discussed, you'd have to write to that, or you'd have to write in the immigrant novel tradition, or you'd have to write um, a, and a kind of show your debt of gratitude in the work to Chinua Achebe as the king of African fiction. Um, but the fact that these novels existed, um, it seemed to indicate to me and to my friends that there was this kind of space where we could create work, right? And that for us was all we needed, like to go off to the races and begin to think in a deep way about the kind of work that we wanted to create. And so I started to write fiction in grad school. Um, and I wrote, as I was writing my, senior, my, my uh, master's thesis on, um, on uh, sort of African leaders who had also been artists, I was also working on my novel, which was, you know, super horrible, but, you know, for me, wonderful because I, I had decided I was going to sit down and write a novel. I was going to write a piece of fiction and I was not going to stop until I finished. And so I did finish a novel at the same time that I finished my thesis. And so when I to return to Google, um, I was working on a second novel by the time I get to Google, a, a novel that was unfortunately stillborn. I couldn't get it across the finish line. And I kind of decided at that point that um, I needed to kind of, I needed, I was missing certain skills. So I began to read lots. I noticed that a lot of my favorite writers were also poets. And so I began this, began this long, um, ex, this long kind of engagement with poetry. I wrote lots and lots of poetry. I try to sell my poetry. Nobody would buy my poetry. It was really sad, but I learned a lot about the art of writing and the art of writing beautiful sentences from spending so much time with, with poetry. And I thought a lot about Achebe as I wrote. Um, you know, about how he had been so successful in his 20s, how he had somehow written this incredibly important and beautiful work that was powerful as a piece of art, but also powerful as a piece of like 
a social critique. And I, and I wanted, I had those same ambitions, like how can I write something that works as a piece of art, but that also comments on what's going on around, around me, socially speaking, politically speaking, spiritually speaking. Um, and I was really deeply interested in that. And so I read, I went back to the book again and again and tried to kind of, uh, since I didn't have access to Achebe, try to unearth the secrets that he had buried in the text as to how he had created this work. I also thought about his courageousness, you know, um, and I spoke a bit about this last night. It's something that I became really obsessed with, the idea that um, he wrote a novel that was not like the novels that were being published at the time. Um, and he had no guarantee, like he, unlike me and other people in my generation who are writing, he didn't have a sense of what the market was because there wasn't a market. And he still wrote this thing that kind of resonated in such a powerful way. And I wondered like if it would be possible in 21st century to do something similar with the kind of work that, that I wanted to create. Um, and I wanted to kind of, I also, you know, had arguments with Achebe as well. You know, I had disagreed with certain perspectives he had, disagreed with certain ways that he kind of constructed the novel. And I wanted to write a novel that responded in a way to some of these concerns I had about some of his personal beliefs, some of his academic beliefs, and some of his artistic beliefs as well. Um, so I published, as I mentioned, my first short story while I was working on my novel. It's a story called Miracle. Um, I should say that I had written a number of stories. I actually still have the Excel spreadsheet where I was kind of tabulating all the rejections I got. And I got about 163 rejections before a journal called Transition at Harvard um, agreed to publish a short story. And so they published a short story and I had a mentor at the time uh, who's still a mentor, a really wonderful person who's been deeply important to me. And, I, um, and so the story was published and I had a number of friends who were trying to make it as musicians. And so they would, they often had, you know, mixtapes with them whenever they saw somebody, you know, like a producer, somebody they would, you know, sort of hand over the mixtape. So I adopt this idea with my work. And my mentor, his name was Helen Habila, who's a wonderful writer um, of, of African fiction as well and all kinds of fiction. I happened to run into him somewhere and I always had my stories on me. So I said, hey, Helen, would you mind reading a story? And he kind of looked at me and he, you know, he kind of shook his head and said, okay, you know, I guess he kind of took it out of a sense of pity. Um, but then he, on the train, he called me from the train. And I remember this because we were cut off mid conversation. And he said, this is a really important uh, piece of fiction. I think you should submit it to the Kane prize. Now this blew my mind. Cause I didn't know that I was eligible for the Kane prize because again, I was not born or raised in Africa. My parents were, and he said, no, no, um, you know, if you are, if you have one parent who was born in Africa, then you're eligible for the Kane prize. And he said, nobody's ever won or even been shortlisted uh, from the diaspora, but perhaps you could be the first. And so I asked Harvard to submit the story on my behalf to the Kane prize. And I found out a few months later that I'd been shortlisted for the Kane prize. Um, so after I was shortlisted, there began this entire conversation um, about like sort of African fiction and whether I was writing African fiction and whether I was even qualified for the prize. Uh, one of the things I remember is that after I found out and winning the prize, it was such a head trip. You know, we were all at the Bodleian Library at Oxford of all places. So you have a bunch of uh, people uh, wearing sort of uh, all kinds of wonderful African clothes uh, in the Bodleian Library. And somebody goes up to the podium and says, you know, here are the five shortlisted writers for the Kane Prize. And the person who has won the Kane Prize is, and they said my name. And after they said my name, uh, again, another moment of sort of like what's going on. And then all these cameras kind of descended on me because there were reporters there from Reuters and the BBC across Europe, NPR. It was incredible. And they all, um, to a person, were asking me like, are you an African writer? Uh, do you, are you somebody who deserves to win this prize? And so that was a question that I kind of dealt with a lot um, as, as I began this tour. But I had this wonderful opportunity to travel all over Africa after winning the Kane Prize and Europe and America. And it was really wonderful kind of tour. And it changed the way that I thought about fiction, the kind of fiction that I wanted to uh, produce as well. I met many African writers um, in South Africa, in Germany, in the UK, across the United States. And we had all, all kinds of wonderful conversations about the kind of work that we wanted to do. And we also spoke about Achebe constantly, like, you know, <laughs> some of us had, you know, sort of arguments with Achebe, some of us loved his work and would get upset and anybody who questioned the value of his work. So there was this ongoing conversation about his influence among all of us. I think the most, and I recognize that I'm running short on time, so I will I try to conclude this as quickly as I can, but this is really important. I think the most significant experience I had after winning the Kane Prize 
uh, was that I was placed on a list of uh, most promising African writers under 40. Again, there is a kind of anxiety around identity because I wasn't born and raised in Africa, but I was included on this list because I won the Kane Prize. And so one of the great things that happened because of this um, being named to this list was that the Hay Festival invited all of us to Nigeria to, as the Nigerians would say, Port Harcourt, Port Harcourt in Nigeria. So there were about 20, 20 plus, 20 so, uh, or so of us who made the trip. Um, and um, other writers who didn't make the list but were in Nigeria descended on Port Harcourt as well. Some writers came from Lagos, writers came from Abuja, some writers came from outside Nigeria because they recognized this is one of the one of the few times when you have a bunch of African writers in one place who are all interested in talking about African literature. And here's a picture of us uh, during one of these events. You'll see me smiling perhaps too widely in the back. Uh, but I was so happy to be among this group of writers from all over the continent and the diaspora as well. And we spent all of our time over copious amounts of alcohol talking about, you know, like African writing, what we wanted to do, our grand ambitions. And so after this moment, I kind of had a sense of where I could contribute to the kind of conversation around African writing and the kinds of things that I wanted to do. Uh, so here's the book that was published after this um, sort of festival in Nigeria. And, um, and the thing is that we're, we're also in this moment when you have African publishing houses that are beginning to publish work like the great example is Cassava Press in Nigeria. So you have, you have publishing that is centered in, in Nigeria and is actually beginning to kind of publish books that will be read by the world. And that for, I think for all of us was important as well. Uh, and so it, it came to me that we're actually, there's a kind of African renaissance that's happening right now that nobody has written about in depth, but that is occurring as we speak. You know, if you walk into a bookstore today, you'll likely see a number of books by Nigerian writers, Kenyan writers, South African writers, and there's still not nearly enough. Um, I'm convinced of that. But the fact that, you know, um, somebody who was like me, say 15 years ago, can now walk into a bookstore and not be elated at the fact that there's, you know, just one book by an African writer, but many books, I think, is a testament to the fact that things have changed in a dramatic way. And it's a wonderful kind of season uh, to be somebody who's interested in African literature. There's still profound constraints. You know, people in the West will determine what kind of work will get published. Um, but those walls are beginning to break down. And I think that's incredibly important. I've had this wonderful opportunity to travel to Nigeria every year since I won the Kane Prize and some years, in some years too, like last year, because of the pand pandemic was the first time since 2013 that I haven't been to Nigeria. And every time I go, I spend time with writers and visual artists, um, with uh, critics, and we talk about writing. And, and as I was finishing up my novel, I kind of had a, a sense of how I wanted my novel to respond to a lot of things that, that are happening in the world and in African literature as well. So my debut novel, uh, was published in 2019. And it was, for me, deeply meaningful because it came out in August of 2019, which of course is 400 years after the first slaves landed in America in 1619, uh, in August of 1619, actually. So the fact that my book came out 40 years later, and I am a writer who is in the diaspora, but it was also an American writer for me, was deeply meaningful and important. So I wouldn't be here speaking with you if it weren't for Chino Achebe. Um, his example continues to inspire me and countless African writers around the world uh, because he created a work of art that moved people and convinced so many people of our humanity. And I think that's just important. Um, and he kind of inspired successive generations to create art that critique their societies as well, right? The one important thing to remember is that Achebe was also critiquing certain aspects of it. He didn't feel this responsibility to present the best face to the world. He said, here's what's going on here as well. And that inspired many of us who also have kind of critiques of the communities we live in and want to render those critiques in prose. Um, but I think the, the biggest and most important legacy of Achebe is that his most well-known book is called Things Fall Apart, but he taught us how to forge new connections and how to fashion thriving new communities in which all of us could create art that can have a chance to live uh, and thrive in the world that we inhabit right now. That's my, and thank you so much for listening. And I really enjoyed this opportunity. Thank you so much, Tope. Thank you so much. Um, what a beautiful talk. You just wove together so many things that I did not expect and, um, so much of what you said resonated with like my growing up. And so I just, I was just really, it was really beautiful to learn about you as a writer. Um, and I hope everyone um, was able to, to, to learn about just the, the broader context 
um, that Cheve was writing in. And I, so two things that really stuck with me, um, I think very early on in the talk, you said something about the that things fall apart is the only place where um, readers at the time get to contemplate the full humanity of Africans. And that just really, that really deeply resonated with me just as a person who, um, I read it young, but I didn't like, like you didn't actually like study it until grad school. And just thinking about like, you know, the people I knew who read it, and that was the only African novel they read and and thinking about the characters in the novel and their, and their humanity, but, um, which is not even to say anything about Achebe. Like you don't get to study who Achebe was and the intellectual he was until, yeah. until I don't even think that the people who were reading it when, you know, when they were younger thinking about Achebe and um, who he was. Um, thank you. I also need to say that Leslie Hill is a good friend of mine. And so when oh, you really? dropped her name, I immediately texted her. Oh. Um, she just retired last year. Oh, last really? Year. She did. So I'm hoping that she's going, she's like, when she reads that I'm imagining she'll be like, oh, so I just need to tell oh, you that. Well, that's that's wonderful. I haven't spoken to her in, gosh, 20 years, I guess. So <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. she was incredibly important professor. You know, the thing about Leslie Hill is that uh, she gave me my one B plus at at, um, oh. at Bates. And I was mad at her for a long time about that. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was very upset with her. But, you know, I think she was she was pushing. I recognize now that she was saying, uh, you know, maybe people have been coddling you for, for too long. I think you're capable of better. And, and she reminded me that I needed to kind of push myself to the very edges of my ambition and talent, you know, so I'm grateful to her for that. Well, look what that B plus did, or whatever. <laughs> um, and time heals all wounds, and I'm glad that you have healed them all. Um, <laughs> next, we are going into the, the facilitated small group discussion. So those of you who were 